What's up Squares? Harold Perkins here with another mortgage Q&A. We've received all of your questions over the past week and have selected the most interesting of them to answer right here. Best question wins question of the week. Let's go. Question one is about student loans. Erica asks, is there any way around the half percent payment hit on student loan debts? I owe 300,000 in student loans, but pay nothing. It's throwing off my debt to income ratio. Erica with 300,000 in student loan debt, I hope you're a doctor. A lot of people go to college for seven years. I know, they're called doctors. So what Erica is talking about is the guideline that requires an estimated payment to be counted against the qualifying if the student loans are in deferment. Well, the thing is, everybody's student loans are in deferment right now due to COVID. Currently, the student loan payment deferments have been extended through the end of the year, but all of the different loan agencies require that a payment be considered against the qualifying because the deferments are temporary. The idea here is that the underwriters don't want to approve a loan that later you will not be able Able to afford once your student loan payments kick back in. So Fannie Mae and FHA require that 1% of your student loan balance be counted against you as a monthly payment. So for you, that would be $3,000 per month. Freddie Mac requires a half percent of the balance as the payment, which would be $1,500 per month counted against you. And VA requires 5% of the loan balance divided by 12, which would be $1,250 per month on a $300,000 student loan. Side note, VA is the only agency that will allow student loan debt to be excluded from your qualifying if you can document that the deferment will last at least 12 months after your closing date. Erica, you're in a tough spot because the estimated payment that the agencies require is probably a much higher payment than what your actual student loan payment will be once they come off of deferment. So if the estimated payment disqualifies you, then your options are limited. Option one is to take your student loans off of deferment so you can find out what the actual payment will be. You might qualify for the mortgage with a lower student loan payment, and of course the downside is that if you take the loan off of deferment then you have to start making payments on the student loan that sucks <laughs> option two would be to add another applicant or a co-signer for your mortgage hopefully the additional income will be enough to support the estimated student loan payment question two is from emily we can afford to make double payments on our mortgage and we plan to sell the house in three to five years would it be better to save the money or continue to make double payments this question is awesome and sometimes it gets people fired up. Double payments in this scenario where you know you're going to sell your house is bad. There are better uses of the money and I am assuming that you have a low interest rate on your current mortgage. So here's the hypothetical math of it. Everything extra that you pay to your mortgage automatically gets applied to the principal of your loan. So when you sell your house, your principal balance on your loan will be lower, which means that your net proceeds from the sale will be higher. Well, that's great. But the additional money that you get from the proceeds of your sale was your own money that you paid into the mortgage in the first place. All you did was take your own money that you already had, sent it to your mortgage company for them to hold for a few years, and then when you sold your house, you took it all back. Why do that? Just keep the money. You already have it. So the math nerd in me does recognize that you do save some money in interest by paying extra to the principal. But the amount of the savings is so very small. Let's say you paid an extra $1,000 a month on your mortgage. That's $12,000 per year. And if your interest rate is 3%, then that's $360 that you've saved in interest for the year. So you've spent $12,000 to save $360 and you don't have any access to that money until you sell your house. So what I would do is invest that money into something, anything. It's very likely that you would be able to find a financial advisor that would be able to make you more than 3% return on your investment. And you will always have access to the money in case of emergency. So as long as the return on your investment is more than the interest rate on your mortgage, it does not make sense to make extra payments to the mortgage. This would be a totally different story if your goal were to pay off your mortgage and live in your house forever. Then yes, pay extra to the mortgage and pay it off as fast as you can. 
can. But you should only ever pay off your mortgage if you plan on never having a mortgage again in your life. Two awesome questions so far. As always, if you find this information helpful or if you know someone who's had similar issues with their mortgage application, please hit the like button so more people can see videos like this. Also, make sure to submit your questions in the comments below or message me on any of my socials. I'll write you back to answer your questions right away and the best questions will make next week's video. And now, the question of the week. This one is from Brooke and it's about PMI. I'm so confused on PMI and how it works. What would the PMI be on a $300,000 loan with 10% down? Credit scores are over 760 and I have a low debt to income ratio. Awesome question and there's no direct answer. First, what is PMI? Well, it stands for private mortgage insurance and it's what you pay if the down payment on your house is less than 20% of the sales price. It's the insurance that protects the bank in case you default on your loan. So let's say you put 10% down and you never make a payment on the loan and the bank has to foreclose on you. The cost to the bank to execute the foreclosure and then sell your house after the foreclosure will probably exceed the 10% that you put down. And that's where PMI comes in. If the bank expenses in the foreclosure exceed what they're able to recoup from the sale of the house after, then the bank will file a claim with the PMI company for the difference. Of course, an insurance policy comes with monthly payments for the premiums, and that's what you're paying as a part of your monthly payment in the mortgage. But the cost of PMI depends on many factors, and different PMI companies charge different rates. The rate they charge is a percentage of the loan amount. So here are the basics. The higher your credit score, the lower your PMI rate will be. The larger your down payment, the lower the PMI rate will be. A loan with two borrowers will have a lower PMI rate than a loan with one borrower. Also, debt to income ratios higher than 45% will increase the cost of your PMI. And a primary residence loan will have a lower PMI rate than a second home or an investment property. Yeah, that's right. There are dozens of loan specific factors that can affect your PMI rate, but there's also more than one way to pay your PMI. You don't have to pay the PMI as part of your monthly payment. You can choose an upfront lump sum payment of the PMI. Okay, last fun fact for for PMI for today. On an FHA loan, it never cancels if your down payment is less than 5% of the purchase price, cancels after 11 years if your down payment were 5% or more, VA loans do not have PMI, and on conventional loans, the PMI automatically cancels at the point that your loan balance reaches 78% of the original purchase price or the appraised value from when you took the loan. But there are other ways to cancel your PMI on conventional loans. Ask me how in the comments below or message me on any of my socials and I'll write you back right away to tell you how. Later, nerds.